Normally when people go racing, they take money and light it on fire. That's what they do. I did it differently. It was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it was something my grandfather gave me and tried to get me to read. That's how you build a business. That's how you have a legitimate nonprofit or charity keep existing. And that's how you just don't go broke. How wealthy are those people? Like how big is their trust fund? I'm gonna blow a million dollars and not even feel it. I've got some Fast and the Furious money here that I wanted to try to burn, but I got really disappointed because it, it doesn't burn. It, it just, this money doesn't burn. That's disappointing. And I brought this up because I was thinking about it because recently there's some stupid troll and he's like, Casey purchase a phony, a big fat phony. Durr, he hasn't raced in any professional series. <laughs> Whatever. So anyway, I bring that up because it actually got me thinking relating to the economics and how I've gone racing over all these years and also how I've not lost money on cars and the way I've been able to have cool cars, trade up, make my work and sweat equity matter uh, and actually get somewhere. And when I thought about it, I've actually never paid to go racing in a manner of speaking. And that's because normally when people go racing, they take money and light it on fire. That's what they do. I did it differently. And suffice it to say, whether it was a go-kart or a production-based car or a vintage car that potentially is an actual asset, and we're gonna talk about what an asset actually is, the money that I put in these cars to restore them or race prep them, um, I would get back when I sold it because I would get something cheap. I would put my sweat equity into it to restore it, build it, make it better and make the value higher. And so the money I had to put into it for parts and materials to restore it is smaller than what the vehicle was worth in the end, more than what I had in it. And as I said, I never had to do this. I never had to burn money to go racing because let's use nice round numbers. Let's say somebody buys a car for a race car for $40,000 and they got to put $5,000 in it to restore it. Okay. So they got 45 grand in this thing. And let's say over the course of a year, they decide to go to X number of events and uh, spend another five grand. So they got 50 grand in a vehicle. They got to go racing and they have this asset. Now let's say they trade it and move it on or something. And that vehicle's worth, I don't know, 80 to $120,000. Well, what just happened is they didn't burn the money. They took the money, they put it into a vehicle. Let's pretend it's this one. And then when the vehicle went away, guess what they got? More money. And then you can take that money, put it into another vehicle, a small amount, put the effort in, go racing. And guess what you get back when you're done? More money. And it's not money per se, because Let's be honest, American tender or any other dollar bill, dinar or euro around the world is nothing different than Fast and the Furious money. This might be worth something at a live action show before it went bankrupt. Exactly the same way legal tender is worth something before your country goes bankrupt. Because it's just a game. But the point I'm bringing up is too many people out there think that in racing, you just burn money because that's what a lot of people do. And the fact of the matter is I've talked candidly about how the road to Indy is a place for rich young people to do this, to burn their family money. Because there's no ROI, there's no return on investment, let's use the whole acronym, for a legit sponsor. There's nobody watching, what, there's like 5,000 people watching their live stream where you can't even see the sponsors on the cars and there's no call to action or anything. And then nobody's really watching it from IndyCar, so at most you might have 20 to 40,000 people there watching. Maybe 5,000 people are paying attention. Maybe 500 people see it. No, there's not an ROI because there's no way to structure professional racing or lower racing like that to make money. So in fact, you are burning money. So to burn this much money, you have to be of a class of person that you can afford to do that and you don't feel it and you don't care. Myself and most of you people watching are not that wealthy. So we don't get to go racing. Now, an interesting thing I hear said a time or two out there in the paddock to racing or to my team, oh, Casey just bought a Lamborghini. Why isn't he racing? Durr. 
because the Lamborghini that I bought is bottomed out in market value. And the two that I have are the last of the Lamborghini with stick shifts. And they're worth more than what I have in them. And that is called an asset because it's not about owning something just for the sake of it. I love the cars, that's awesome. But I chose to have cars and do things that are an actual investment. So you could theoretically trade and move on, or if you just need to get your money out of it quick, you could. But those are also the things that I enjoy. So just because anybody in the world is able to invest in something, maybe that's their house in one circumstance, or maybe they have a fancy car, doesn't mean they're going to take an asset or whatever it is that they've worked their entire life to have tangibly, turn it into paper money and light it on fire for something with no ROI. And like Road to Indy, there's no ROI. There's nowhere to go. You'd just be burning the money. And I'm not a stupid business person. So I bring that up because there was a book, I think it was written in the late 90s. It was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it was something my grandfather gave me and tried to get me to read. Well, I was young and dumb and a jerk and didn't want to read and I didn't read the book. But in that amount of time, I learned what it was all about. And actually my grandfather's gone right now and I miss him a lot, but I think he saw something in me with business that he was trying to stoke with that book. And what that book is about is this. I was a young man, the author, I believe he was in Hawaii. He had his father, which I believe had a PhD and worked very, very, very hard and barely made any money. And the money he got would go away. It would get burned. So they lived modestly or poor because the very smart, studious dad, they did everything right by the game, would have to light their money on fire and then it would be gone. But they had a friend with the dad who was rich. And the so-called rich dad of the friend uh, taught them the basics of money. And suffice it to say, the book is about this. The reason people stay broke, and you can, this doesn't matter whether it's life or cars or racing. When you get money, however that is, through whatever means you have, if you get any money, if you take that money and spend it in a way where it's burned and gone and you can't get it back, that's called a liability. So for instance, just going racing, modern racing, where you pay to buy a ride and go out there and there's no possible ROI or anything for you to gain, that's a liability. That's spending money like, <laughs> like it's ancient Rome and you got lead poisoning. And there's a lot of other ways to do that. People that buy a brand new car, that's also a liability because you're gonna lose a lot to depreciation just for the sake of it. So like the person that goes out and buys a brand new Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something, yeah, they're losing a ton of money to depreciation. They're gonna burn, I don't know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000, maybe more, just for the sake of fashion. And that's stupid. Um, there's so many things in life like that. So the point of this is, what's the opposite of that? The opposite is an asset. Because you don't have to just burn your money where it's gone. An asset, that could be a business where you don't have to run it and it makes you money. That could theoretically be a stock that's rising. That could be some sort of commodities. Maybe you invest in gold and platinum while it's on the rise. Those are all assets because you can put your money into it and then get it out. And at worst, when you take it out, maybe you'll lose a tiny bit, but you still got the money. But at break even, or better yet, when you take it out, you got more. <laughs> so, I bring that up and I say it with a little bit of frustration because so many people, even smart people, even people with money that watch my channel and go, I don't understand. My entire life I've lived in a way where I didn't do this. With everything I did, business, work, buying cars, anything. I have never in my life bought a new car or motorcycle because I know you'll just lose money. That's why even to this day, I was just banging around in a $5,000 Porsche 944 from 1984. And I could daily it instead of losing a ton of money depreciation because I'm afraid of my car breaking. Buying a new car is the fastest, stupidest way to lose money. <laughs> I swear to God. Um, 
But if you live your life in a way where you don't burn your money and you only put it into things that are gaining in value or you won't lose it, you win. Because as it comes down to cars, there's only three types of cars. There's cars where you lose money after you buy it. There's cars where you break even. And there's cars where you make money. Meaning, the only car you should ever buy is a car where you can potentially make money. And the only time you should ever buy a car where you'll just break even is that you can afford to have your money sit there and not have to work for you, which is stupid. Um, but you really like the car. And buying a car where you lose money, stupid. I have never done that. For the longest time buying used cars, I'd get something, I'd find a really smoking deal with a car with low miles, that was taken care of well, and hopefully has new tires, and then I'd keep it for a year or two, sell it for what I've got, maybe a little more, and break even from the cost that were in it. I might not even have to get new tires. And what I did is I drove for free. So when you hear these guys about exotic cars and all, car traders and stuff, talking about how they bought a car and got to drive for free, that's what they mean. They bought the car, like maybe some guy buys a car for $100,000. They have to do exotic car service and stuff for 15 and insurance and gas and stuff and it costs them another five. And those idiots sold it for 130. Well, you do the math and they made 10 grand. And that's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer in the middle class. And that's why you're stuck doing that. And I remember when I was much younger, I remember my little brother was talking to the parents and he wanted to get this 90s BMW 3 Series and I think it cost like 11 or 12 grand, which was a ton of money. I never had a car that was that much money as a daily driver. And I remember him talking about that and it kind of annoyed me and I said to him, I'm like, you're gonna lose money on that because at the time, if he started driving that, that car's already kind of expensive, he would only be able to sell it when he's done with it for maybe five grand. I'm like, you guys are gonna lose money. Like, my little brother can't afford to lose the six grand just so he can get a stupid BMW. So what happened was, he burned the money. And the parents let him burn the money. Why? I don't know, it was stupid. Don't listen to me, whatever. Um, and I didn't do that. Now, once in a blue moon, I have lost money on a car where there was a mistake or something, uh, or something blew up that I didn't expect. But that's part of the risk. But if you live that way, generally you'll come out ahead. So regardless of what you invest in or what you do with your money or how you're trying to get through life, the whole rich dad, poor dad thing comes down to one thing. Don't blow your money on liabilities, things that cost more money. Like, you know, your house is largely a liability unless it's going up. Because <laughs> you've got things that can go wrong. You got insurances, you got taxes, you got everything that goes into it, and then you have to make it. Also, where are you gonna live? You buy new cars, they depreciate. You buy basket cases, you don't get your money out of it. But if you get something like that that's nice, guess what? When I go to sell it, I'll either get my money out of it or maybe I'll get a trade up and because it'll be worth something more. Or I just have the car I like and I get a keep. So this being a car chain, I wanna bring that up. And when you start to understand how to not lose money, <laughs> and how to put it in things that potentially would give you an ROI and how to actually structure them because there's intangible ways of making money. It isn't all just having an asset that you sell and it works out. You might have something that costs a little bit of money or takes effort in your time to make happen. By the way, time is money. But it's worth it because it helps you other places move the ball forward, make connections, get together with people in business. And the more you start to think this way and understand, it's literally just a stupid game. You've got your intelligence, you've got your way you interact with people, you've got your integrity, you've got your time, your talent, what you can do with your hands, make something when you have to, and you've got your money. But the other sad thing about it is, I'll tell you this, as people rise, theoretically, they get to a point where maybe they're really talented and got to be able to build things. And that's how they made their money at a lower level. You'll get to a point where uh, that doesn't work anymore and that's not the best way to make it. And the best way to make money and move the ball forward and do business for everybody and everything you're connected to is to make intelligent business moves and strategic things. And that's where your time has to go rather than getting to work with your hands, which is kind of sad, but that's sort of the natural progression. Now I bring that up because it's very quickly evident to me that when people try to look at others and judge them, I had basically Casey's three laws. And one of them was people judge others by their own experiences and standards. So all the people that have ever just thought I was a wealthy twit because I got to 
play with vintage cars or do some racing, that tells me that they don't understand how to invest or build something and no clue. And that's okay, that's not their jam. But it's fascinating to me when you get to a place with smart people, like in racing or in the paddock goes, I don't understand why he's not racing, he just got a Lamborghini. It's because it's an asset, you idiot. I'm not gonna burn my money in a series that gives you no ROI. Because <laughs> I wanna keep moving forward. Because it's simple. It just, it, it boggles my mind that they don't get that. Because the people that are in the paddock are either business people been around racing, or they're wealthy enough to do it. Which is funny, because it makes me wonder. The people that are like, I don't understand if he can buy a Lamborghini, why doesn't he go racing? Like, how wealthy are those people? Like, how big is their trust fund? I'm gonna blow a million dollars and not even feel it. <laughs> That's the way those people are. But I do want to bring this up too, because there's a couple of things. I made some notes so I wouldn't forget about it. Um, I had a CEO that came to me regarding Genius Garage, the nonprofit, and that he wanted to help. Yet, everything that he did, the action, the way the chess pieces were moved, <laughs> wasn't helping Genius Garage so much as making himself look good. Every way he structured it. And I'm not stupid, I saw what he was doing. And eventually, after a long time and much frustration, I wrote him a text message and I said, Genius Garage is a nonprofit for college students, not Fortune 500 companies. I didn't like how he was trying to manipulate it. But when you start to understand the basics of business structuring and how to put everything together and actually how to use your time and money and what the difference is between a liability and asset, you know when people are trying to screw you. Because if they're a CEO, they're probably pretty smart. <laughs> so uh, I don't think it's an accident that he's there. So when he moves the chess pieces in such a way, they're trying to take advantage of a nonprofit and make himself look good and turn me into an indentured servant. <laughs> I call BS. Now, the other thing, and this may be a little edgy, and it's because I'm having fun burning this fake Fast and the Furious money. Oh, it's real Fast and the Furious money, but it's fake money. I'm kind of disappointed that it doesn't burn now. Hmm, anyway, so another thing, Regarding bad business, so racing is a funny business. There has to be an ROI, and that's what I've talked about on this. Now, I only go to a track if it makes sense or I can afford it. I can afford to go go-kart racing. I can afford to have my vintage Formula B and go to a couple races a year, and that thing's an asset in itself. I got a great deal on it, and I'm fixing it up, and I enjoy the work, and it'll be worth more than what I have in it someday. So if I do spend some money going racing with consumables like oils and tires and travel and entry fee, I don't really care because if I only do it so much, um, the car will be worth more than everything I've got in it, including the racing. So basically I got to go racing for free uh, in a manner of speaking, other than my expertise and work and such. So that's kind of what I bring it up. So when I'm trying to go racing on a professional level, a high end level, whether it's open wheel or go to imps or something like that, there has to be an ROI. There has to be a business venture, whether people want me there because I've got enough exposure that it works for their sponsors or what they want. That's what it is. And that's all racing is anymore. There has to be a business and ROI. That's why IndyCar is now a spec series with two engine manufacturers, one chassis manufacturer controlled by one guy, and it's a theater sport. Nobody else gets to come in and do anything because that's how they made money and turned it into a business. Which is sad because the only way to get into a lots of forms of racing is just to burn vast sums of money that's not a good ROI. And I'm not gonna do that. So I just wanna bring that up because for like stupid trolls out there, Casey's Perch is not a real race car driver. He's an idiot. He's not driven in any professional series. Well, yeah, because I'm not so freaking wealthy that I can just burn money. I have to do something with cars that at least keeps me breaking even. That's it, it's business. So if a person's notion of being a professional race king car driver is that they just have to be wealthy enough to burn money, well then I ain't no driver, but uh, but then isn't the definition of being a professional racing driver, you make money at it? Okay, so even if I haven't driven that much, I've driven in vintage races and karting and stuff. The funny thing is I've never paid to go racing. So doesn't that make me a professional race car driver? Maybe, I don't really care, but I did get to go racing and I'm not broke. And the thing about this is, if you guys pay attention and live your life in a manner where you're not just burning money and you put it into assets and work your butt off and live cheaply and figure it out, don't just buy dumb new stuff, <laughs> you know? Like jewelry, jewelry is a stupid place to burn money. You go buy new jewelry. God, you know what markup is on that stuff? Give me a break. 
But you buy vintage stuff, nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. And yet you still, it's still just as shiny and fun, but you don't lose your money. So that's just kind of one of those things I wanted to bring up. There's something else I want to tell you guys about that's really important. Let's see, free rate. what is affording? What is affording? Can you afford to do it? Okay, my blue Dodge Viper. I bought that thing originally back in like 2009. I think I bought it for like 28, I don't know, less than $30,000. Had 19,000 miles on a bunch of stuff and I drove the heck out of it. It got wrecked, totaled. Somebody pulled out in front of me. I was driving legally, by the way. And uh, insurance took the car and paid me out. I got, and then I ended up buying it back after somebody fixed it up. Now I've got like 100,000 miles on that thing. A stupid Dodge Viper now is worth way more than I ever had in it, but that doesn't, that's not kind of the point. The point is with the Viper, if it was only ever worth what I had in it, that's cool. I drove and I had fun. And that's affording a car. I was actually able to afford to drive that car and put the miles on it, which is great because they were a lot of fun and great memories. But there are people that have really nice things that can't actually afford the really nice things. I too have had really nice things I couldn't afford. My Lamborghini Countach I had back when, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> it was like my entire net worth. It was everything I had in that car. I should have kept it longer. I don't want to talk about it. Restored it and got rid of it. But um, I was trying to move forward and the market wasn't doing anything. So um, I couldn't afford to just keep that thing and put miles on it because it was like my entire net worth. So I had to sell it and keep moving and try to do something with my life. So that was an example of not being able to afford it. But then what's worse, in terms of talking about liabilities, there's a bunch of jack wagons at Cars and Coffee and they're probably the same rev boys and you know, like Huracans and newer cars. They're out there revving the crap out of it, don't know the hurt in the bearings, that lease the cars or don't own it or they got a loan on it. They got a high interest loan so they can go flex and make you think they're cool and they're not. They're the same kind of people that before 2008, when anybody get a loan for a house, would have a giant house and no furniture in it because they can't afford furniture. <laughs> it's the same kind of bull crap. And it's amazing too, because ridiculous out of control lending, generally by the government at any given time, uh, like 2008 for the housing market crash, people were getting money for stuff they couldn't afford. So everything crashed. It's just like education. Students are getting loans for crappy majors that they'll go out and not be able to get a job and pay back, but they can't default on it. So they're stuck being servants or slaves to the system forever. Meanwhile, the government's talking about forgiving student loans to make everybody feel good and vote for it. Well, what we really need to do is make the loans where they can be defaulted on so that the college would actually have to give a good education and not give away diplomas like candy so people get jobs and pay it back like any other business. It's simple. That's gonna be a big problem. And the other aspect is if an entire government takes all your money, they burn money. First thing they do is they go out and go, uh, we're not going to raise your taxes, everybody. We're not going to do that. And we don't like the rich. But they go out and they print a crap ton of money. They get it from the Fed. By the way, it's not federal. It's not owned by us. Uh, the United States and this. So they print a lot of money and they give it to people. Yay, we have more money. The economy's up. The stock market's up. Hooray. Uh, it's not. That's called inflation. And inflation is basically taxation that you didn't vote for. Because if all of y'all's money isn't worth what you paid for it, so instead of being worth 100, let's say it's worth 50, that means you need double amount of this to pay for anything. That means you have to work harder to get less. And it doesn't matter whether you're poor, middle class, or wealthy, you still have to pay more. But the funny thing is about inflation and spending like that, being forced taxation for everybody basically, who it really hurts is the poor and the middle class, especially the poor. Because the wealthy can get by it, and then they can figure out ways to make the inflation and asset movement and everything like that work for them. Kind of sucks, doesn't it? So if and y'all are thinking about voting, and you want to go somewhere with your life, um, think about that a little bit. So I just wanted to have this talk because it amazes me how many people don't get stuff. So I also want to point out that you don't have to have a fancy shop, you can have a barn. And there's something out there you can do with your own two hands to take raw material and make it worth more and move forward in life. That's basic business, that's creating something, that's making something, that's being a contributing member of society. <laughs> Go out there and do it and find your way. Truthfully, money is not the only thing that matters because it's just a game. Whether it's Fast and the Furious dollars, Monopoly money, or legal tender from your country, 
it's just paper. At the end of the day, paper is pretty much just something you write on to give information to people, make paper airplanes, or burn. So if you have massive inflation and your money's not worth anything, or you just go burn it, then I hope you really enjoyed the fire because that's all you got. But money's a neat thing because when it looks a little bit nicer, you can take this, give it to somebody else, and because you live in a society where that means something of value or perceived value, it's a power. It's a power to get materials or things or people to work and trade their time for the money. And it allows you to structure things for the betterment of the future. So I guess I do this as talk and I hope it's helpful. Um, but I'll say this much. I also have spent years of my life doing a nonprofit, Genius Crutch, 501c3. And the reason being is I had a crappy college experience. I think my diploma is garbage and it's not worth any paper it's printed on. And uh, there were no real mentors or guides or anybody to help you get on your way in life and I had to fight really, really hard after that. And while I was in college, I saw where the educational system was lighting students' money on fire and not helping these young people get anywhere. And I realized that after 10 years of fighting my way in the world, I had enough around me in a shop of like cool stuff that if I was gonna play with cars and stuff anyway, I might as well help students and help them get jobs. And that's what I've been doing. And truthfully, had I not done that, I would be a lot richer, a lot better off. And I bring that up because even a nonprofit, you have to run the same basic smart business ways. As an example, I don't get paid. No one gets paid. We work our asses off to help people. Anything that ever goes into the nonprofit, the money, is looked at very, very, very carefully so that we don't have to burn very much. The little bit that has to be burned are basics of things like insurances or little utilities or travel for the students, etc. It doesn't go to salaries and stuff. It's not some BS tax dodge for the wealthy crap or race cars. The cars stay there, they stay nice. And we only get rid of one if we don't need it anymore. And all that money stays in the nonprofit. And it's funny because somebody that was a contributor to Genius Garage way back when and has watched and contributed others throughout the years said to me, and my wife Taylor, they said, of every, everything we've ever contributed to, projects of philanthropy or, or um, charitable work out there, yours is the only one that kept going. And I thought about that, and it, it was sad because other things aren't working, of course, but it made me feel good that we were able to keep something going. Now, it wouldn't happen without a heck of a lot of work and it, riding on your own shoulders, metaphorically, but the reason I think when I thought about it, the nonprofit still exists is the basic business aspects that I apply to racing, there has to be an ROI or you're just burning money, is the same thing you apply to everything in business, life, investments, and a nonprofit. If the money can stay in assets and you only use the teeniest, tiniest, like if all the money stays in the things to make it go and grow and do, and only a teeny tiny amount of it is to run it, that means one, it was a good investment for the people that cared about the philanthropy because it's still going. And also you're doing it efficiently. So one day hopefully you can get it to another class structure where it more stands on its own two feet and you can have people when it keeps going. That's how you build a business. That's how you have a legitimate nonprofit or charity keep existing. And that's how you just don't go broke. And I knew this way back when in a small way with cars, because even if I was just trying to afford like a Volkswagen Scirocco, I would buy the one that was like, had good bones, but the cheapest one to get a good deal on it, so I didn't have to put too much money in it. And you know, over the years, like whether it's a Viper or a Corvette or a Volkswagen, it doesn't, mat it doesn't matter. If you put too much money in it in modifications, you won't get that money back. You're just burning that money. And I see young people do it all the time. They're burning tens of thousands of dollars on modification of the car just because it feels good. I mean, you might as well just be doing drugs or going to the strip club. It's the same thing. You're burning your money for no reason. Like, okay, if you wanna do a couple little things, great. But if you have to spend tons of money on a car that's a depreciating asset to make you what you want, one, you're gonna lose a crap ton of money, but it's not what you want. You need to take that money you were gonna modify it with, sell the car for as well as you can and punch out, and then put that money into something else you like more. And preferably something that's bottomed out in market value or may even go up. 
And that's how I've done everything with my life with cars. And that's why I've been able to have a lot of fun and play a lot of games. That's also the reason why I have not gone racing that much because I can't afford to just go racing all the time. It has to be worked into the value of the cars, but because of the cars I've restored and done, I've got to go racing and race really amazing cars that were from X professional series. Whether that's like an IMSA car or an Indy car, or, uh, pfft, WSC, whatever, I've gotten to drive these cars. Of course, it's in vintage racing. It wasn't in the series back then, because again, not wealthy. <laughs> so I guess for all the people out there saying, Casey Putch has driven professional race cars, not in a professional series. He's a pony. <laughs> First of all, they're idiots, but they're, they're missing the whole point of how I've been able to do this, working with my own two hands and not just burning money. And I, I just really want to bring that up. I hope this is a halfway intelligent conversation. And I'm kind of frustrated and showcasing that because it's so simple. I, I don't understand. Like, I guess it's just because I grew up with my grandfather he, World War II vet, Army infantry, he grew up in the Depression, he knew the value of a dollar, he knew the value of helping others and caring and saving, but make your money do something and work for you. And my parents worked their ass off with a stupid little golf course in a little town that tanked because of 2008, when idiots were loaning money to anybody, the government screwed everything up in the lending, so the whole place was worthless. That was a big lesson. <laughs> yeah, so I gotta watch my whole childhood go away because my dad worked 24-7. I know the value of a frickin' dollar. I also know the value of an hour in your life. So that's how I've done these things. Just basic good business sense and not burning money. And I kind of wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, but anyway, that was the thought train I got on uh, when somebody tried to call me a phony race car driver. They can call me that all they want. I don't really care. <laughs> so that's it. And I'll go racing, professional racing, when I figure out how to make the business and marketing of it work out or somebody just wants me to drive. <laughs> And both of those things may never happen because most of racing's business doesn't make sense. Um, so that's it. I should probably end this now. That was fun. That was kind of cathartic, burning that fast and furious money. Although I have to admit, I was really disappointed that it doesn't burn. But um, yeah, I got, I got American dollars, I got euros, and I got dinars in my pocket. I was thinking about burning that. I bet it'd burn better than this. Man, whatever. <laughs> Hollywood. It's so fake, their money doesn't even burn. <laughs> On that note, you guys should subscribe or unsubscribe. You should comment or troll because <laughs> Casey Push sucks. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I might burn some more money. See you guys next time.